Well, let's turn our hearts to the Word of God in the book of Romans. In the book of Romans. So, turn in your Bibles. There's pew Bibles. There's phone Bibles. We'll have it on the screen. Turn to the book of Romans chapter 9. We are continuing through Romans 9 through 11 and then 12 through 16. And again, as you're turning there, as a reminder, in perhaps one of the most difficult places in the Bible, because it puts us face to face with what God wants, regardless of what we want, per se, but it's also potentially the most encouraging in this aspect, meaning you can have the most comfort knowing that God does what he wants to, and when you see that, uh, he wants to save you and bring you all the way home to him and that nothing can stop his will or thwart it, then it is a great source of encouragement. So we're continuing through Romans chapter nine and I'm gonna read from the beginning of Romans chapter nine, verse one, so that you can kind of get the flow of Paul's thought here. Um, Even though we've covered some of this that we're already reading, it's not much. And then I'll get your attention when we get to verse 14, which is where we're starting today. So this is the word of the Lord to you. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption and the glory, the covenants and the giving of the law and the worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs from their ra- and from their race. According to the flesh is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated So this is our passage this morning and how it ties in. What shall we say then to all of this? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Let's pray and ask briefly for his help. Father, let your Holy Spirit open our hearts and minds to have ears to hear and eyes to see you and your ways through this passage and to have the appropriate response, which is wonder and awe and trust. Father, do this in us by your Spirit, we pray. Amen. So we're working again through the most difficult part and it causes a reaction, potentially in you, 
but in other people as well. I've experienced this, but I remember especially the day that Brooke came home from working in the hospital. We were in seminary. I was in seminary. She worked in the hospital uh, as a dietitian, and she came home and said, you would not believe what happened today. She went into a room, uh, and there was a patient in there that she was supposed to assess and assess their nutritional needs, and the family members were in there, and there was also a pastor in there. And uh, I don't know how the conversation happened, because I wasn't there, but Brooke related something like this. Ah, I'm a pastor. I'm a minister in the Methodist church. Oh, that's neat. My husband goes to seminary right now. Oh, where does he go to seminary? Well, he's at Reformed Theological Seminary. Oh, my goodness. And he proceeded to let poor Brooke have it. He, I mean, this was not restrained. This was anger, fierce anger upon poor Brooke there in her lab coat, just trying to figure out nutrition. That's the kind of reaction that this passage can cause. And it causes it in our hearts at times as well. All right, we might know this. We might have understood what Reformed theology is. And essentially, part of what Reformed theology is is just this teaching on this subject. It's so much more than that. But it's also this, that God is sovereign in, to, in whom he gives mercy to. And he's sovereign in whom he does not give mercy to. And so here in this passage, Paul deals with this objection. And maybe the objection is the same in your heart. Or maybe it's the same not just in your heart, but out loud. And you accost poor people like that minister did, like that pastor did. But here's where God's word is leading us next. And so there's kind of two aspects in this passage that come out. Mercy and hardening. Mercy and hardening. And overall is this question. Is God unjust? Is God unjust? And so read with me. If you have it in front of you, which I would encourage you to. Romans 9, starting in verse 14. The question goes like this. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Another word we might use is unfairness. Is there unfairness? Is God being partial when he supposedly is supposed to be just and neutral and fair and giving to all? I mean, that's essentially what this question boils down to. If God gives and chooses whom his mercy goes to and whom his mercy does not go to and therefore who his hardening and judgment goes to, if God is the one who does that, then isn't it unjust or unfair of him to let some people receive his mercy and some be passed by. What did they do to deserve this? And so first, you have to kind of, if Paul is teaching this, this is the kind of objection that we would expect. So part of, or some of you, your question may be, is that what this is actually saying? Like, I've read this part of the Bible. It doesn't actually, I haven't understood it that way, that God is the one who chooses who is saved and who is not. I haven't really read that, or I don't believe that, I think it's actually up to the individual how they respond to God. And we would say, yes, it is up to the individual. But some way, in some mysterious way that I cannot explain, nor, by the way, does Paul explain to our satisfaction at least, that in that, it is God who first moves. Then we respond of our own heart. We're not like robots, but in some mysterious way, God's Choice is ultimate. We have choice, and it's a real choice, and we're held responsible. But somehow, in some way, what this passage is teaching is that God's choice is above ours. It's ultimate. It's the creator's choice. Ours is the created choice. We have no idea how that goes together, but we see in Scripture 
that both are taught. And part of the way, just part of the way, is because if he weren't teaching this, Paul, he wouldn't have this objection. He wouldn't have to face this objection. If salvation wasn't ultimately God's choice, if it, as in verse 16, if it depended on human will or running, as the verse says, if it depended on human will, then God would not be accused of injustice because God would be giving to each as they've earned. Earned his grace by choosing him, earned his hardening in judgment by not choosing him. If that's what the Bible taught, you wouldn't have someone saying, well, is God unjust then? The claim of injustice only comes if someone is teaching that God's choice is determinative, is ultimate. So that's starting out here. This verse 14 doesn't make sense unless the Bible is teaching that God's choice is ultimate. And so we see, we sense that fire in that pastor's heart and potentially in your heart towards this. But this is what actually Paul does with this this objection, this claim. Look at what he goes to in verse 15. This is his answer. He could say anything in the world. He could say, ah, I didn't mean that. I, I didn't mean that it was up to God. This is what he says in verse 15. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. He's quoting what we read earlier this morning in the book of Exodus, where Moses says, show me your glory. Show me your favor, Lord God. And he says, yes, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. Implication, I will have mercy on you, Moses. You've asked for mercy to show you who I really am and not destroy you in the process, I'll show you that mercy. So when God's justice or his fairness is called into question, what Paul points to is mercy. What Paul points to is mercy. And so we begin to see what Paul is doing. Paul is making a distinction here between mercy and between justice. They are not the same thing. Mercy and justice are not on the same plane here. And to help illustrate this, Jesus himself actually has to deal with this question. In the book of Matthew, this is what we read. He tells a parable. The Jews here are standing before him. He's teaching to them. This is one of his teachings. Listen to how he responds to this question. And the illustration that Jesus gives of how this actually works out. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. I don't know if you've ever been there to the edge of a construction store like Lowe's and you see people out ready to find a job laboring in a vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers, for a denarius a day, a day's wage, after agreeing with them, he sent them into his vineyard. And about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. So he's on more people standing around. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I'll give you. So they went, going out again about the sixth hour, later in the day, and the ninth hour, even later in the day, like evening almost, like four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock, like the day's almost over. About the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one's hired us. So he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. Then evening came. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, his manager, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, 
Each of them received a full denarius. Now, when those who who were hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. So do you see what's happened here? The ones who were called like at the last hour, they got a full day's wage. And the ones who have been working all day got a full day's wage. They all got the same wage. They all worked very different amounts. And beginning to rise up in their hearts is this response. And on receiving it, they, the first ones who'd been working all day, grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. And he asked him a question. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? Man, Jesus takes it in the same direction that Paul does. This is not about justice. This is about mercy. Justice would be giving you what I owe you. And I have given you what I've owed you. Mercy is free of obligation. It's gift giving. It's like you had money left over at the end of the day and you dole it out. You don't owe that extra money to anyone. You haven't started up a contract with anyone saying, oh, I'll pay you a denarius. Oh, well, you paid him a denarius. You, this, at this point, mercy is in the free category. Here is what Paul is pointing to. We're not talking about justice here. So when these opponents, or maybe in your heart, or in that minister's heart, God is unjust to give salvation to some and not others. To give mercy to some and not others. And Paul's response and God's response is this. This is not about justice. This is not about me giving what is owed and not giving what is owed. My salvation is a gift. It is free and therefore it is not justice. It is mercy. That's his first response here. He confirms this in verse 16. So it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. How does this hit your heart? Take a break for a moment. Think for a moment here as you consider the difficulty of this passage. Because for some of you, uh, so I brought this up to our student group. We're meeting uh, and going through this passage because this is where I've been studying the most and I'm the most helpful on it at this moment. So these poor students... Uh, get to hold rabbits and hear about predestination. And, uh... and so I asked, what are some oppositions that you have in your heart to this or that you've heard others have? And we talked about this. And one of the things that came out was, I know this is not a matter of justice, but it's still my heart wants it to be that everyone receives mercy. I want everyone to receive mercy. I know it's not a matter of justice. If God justly gave what people deserved, none of us would get anything but wrath. I get that. But I still want mercy to all. I want mercy to all. And I get that. The idea that God uh, would not give mercy when he could give mercy is difficult for us. It's difficult for the students. It's difficult for me. Paul's answer here is to point to, first of all, that it's mercy, and second of all, to God's choice. Ultimately, God did not want that. He didn't choose that, and that is hard for us. But this is Paul's answer to you 
He points to mercy. But second in this passage, Paul quotes another part of Scripture to help talk about the freedom of God to do as he pleases as the master of the vineyard. And it has to do here not with mercy anymore, not with mercy and justice, but actually with hardening and justice. So read with me here in this passage. Verse 17, he continues. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, really God says it to Pharaoh, so it's a neat little Easter egg here hiding, that in some places where God speaks, the author says scripture speaks, hence what scripture says God says, neat little moment. Verse 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. So Paul says, that was mercy to Moses. That, that's not justice, that's mercy. If you want to talk about justice, let's talk about justice. And he quotes here this interaction with Pharaoh, which is interesting. Because if you've ever read this passage in the book of Exodus, starting around chapter 4, all through the plagues here to chapter 10, 11, there's this interaction, this back and forth between God and Pharaoh. And in it, multiple times, seven times some have counted, is this interchange between God through Moses to Pharaoh and Pharaoh. And it's this issue of hardening and justice. And so let me read for you a little bit about this so you can see why Paul is bringing this in here. Exodus 4, verse 21. The Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, Moses, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Again in Exodus 7, you shall speak and command you, uh, and Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart, even though I multiply my signs, or uh, though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I'll lay my hand on Egypt, and my people will go out of the land, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And yet here, in Exodus 7, we see another instance. So Moses is there in the presence of Pharaoh and his, uh, he cast down his staff to make it turn into a snake and the magicians do the same. And this is the comment that the Lord makes that Moses writes happened. For each man cast down his staff and they became serpents, but Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them. Again, with the plague of the frogs, listen to what it says. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a break from the frogs, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them. So here in scripture, you have this repetition, this cycle, where sometimes it says God hardened his heart, and other times it says he hardened his own heart. He, wouldn't, he refused, he was stiff-necked towards the mercy of God. He got a break from the frogs, and he was stiff-necked to the mercy, he hardened his own heart. So here in this passage, what we are intended to see is this. We're not talking about mercy at this point. We're talking about justice. And according to justice, because Pharaoh hardened his heart against God first, God is free at that point to harden. I mean, he's free before that. Let me just state that. Let me restate that. God, according to justice, hardens Pharaoh's heart. We read about that. We read about that in Romans chapter one, where it says he gave them over to the lusts of their hearts because they refused to worship him. They refused and he gave them over. So if you want to talk about justice, justice is we refuse to worship God and God gives us over to his wrath. That is justice. That's not mercy. That's justice. If you want fairness, 
what the Bible says is fairness for all of us is that we deserve wrath. We deserve justice. If that troubles you, right? We talked about if mercy troubles you. But if God's wrath on injustice, I mean on justice troubles you, it might be because you have trouble with the basics here. We have gone through the book of Romans as a whole. We've gone through Romans chapter one, two, three, all the way up now to chapter nine. When you were listening to the first part of Romans, did you go, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, the gospel, uh uh-huh, through faith in Jesus Christ, uh uh-huh, for all have fallen short, or for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. If you said, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, here, then you should be saying, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, here. All have fallen short of the glory. All have exchanged the truth of God for a lie. All deserve his hardening. All deserve his wrath. That's justice. That is due. So if you have trouble here with God, the idea of God hardening people who have hardened themselves against God, it might be because you have trouble with the basics of what sin is there. So I would encourage you to go back and look at Romans chapter one of God turning people over after the hardness of their hearts. He doesn't make people sin. He doesn't make people turn against them. But when they turn against him, what this is saying is that he hardens them in that. And that choice is his. That choice is his to give justice where justice is due and mercy is where where mercy is due here. So you can begin to see that once you draw it out, once you look at what Paul is saying about, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, I'll harden whom I harden, you can see the response of that pastor's heart to Brooke, but really to God in this. How dare you? That makes God the author of evil. That makes God unfair. Is there injustice on God's part? Paul's answer is by no means. So stop commentator, an author, a preacher, a pastor, says this. The wonder is not then that some are saved and others are not, but that anybody is saved at all. For we deserve nothing at God's hand but judgment. If we deserve, or if we receive what we deserve, which is judgment, or if we receive what we do not deserve, which is mercy, in neither case is God Unjust. If, any, if therefore anybody is lost, the blame is theirs. But if anybody is saved, the credit is God's. This contains a mystery which our present knowledge cannot solve. But it is consistent with scripture, history, and experience. And so this is where it comes down to the personal Forget about what God does in other people's lives. Consider you're standing there in front of Jesus and you're receiving your wage for what you've done. Look at your own life and could you stand before Jesus and say, give me what I deserve? Could you look at all that you were meant to be, to love fully with all of your heart, mind, and soul, and all of the choices you've made and the stiffness of your neck again, could you stand before Jesus and say, Give me what I deserve. If you can't, if you can't say that, then you understand. If you said that to Jesus, then you don't fully understand your own sin and you don't fully understand justice here. This is difficult teaching. But the wonder is not that anyone is saved or that some are saved and not others, but that anyone is saved at all. So I wanna end with this. I wanna take our hearts to this. This is what the wonder should be at. The difficulty should be at. Not that some are saved and that others are not, and that God does it as he wills. The wonder for you should be if you have experienced the mercy of God. That should be the wonder in your life. That should be where your heart is focused on. I was watching a, a show. There's not much on. I look through Netflix and Prime and like, is there anything I haven't seen? Is there anything worth seeing? 
And so I like the outdoors, and so I picked the show alone where people get 10 items, and they go out, and they have to survive all alone, and they have their own camera equipment, and every month or so, medical teams come in and check on them, and if they're too emaciated, they pull them out, um, or if they tap out, they can call, and they come and get them. They get their footage uh, every month, and then they bring them fresh batteries and fresh cameras and memory cards, and they keep filming, and then at the end of all this, they put together this show, and the seasons go throughout. And so they start with 10 people on these super remote places. And the big draw is, if you win, if you're the last to be alone on this place, whether it's the desert or the island or the tundra, you win a million dollars or half a million now. I don't know. You win a lot of money. And so you start to hear these people's stories of why they're doing that, why they're going for the money, what they've signed up for. And they say this, if I can make it, I think I can. I've... I love camping, I love hunting, I, I think I could do this. If I sign up for this, uh, if I can make it through the hard parts, if I could just get that money, it would all be worth it. And so they go, and it's, it's entertaining to see how they try to survive, what they do. But what's most entertaining is seeing them struggle with what they signed up for. It's kind of mean, it's kind of sad, it probably shows more about my heart, but like when three days in, they're in their tent and they hear noises out in the dark and they start crying. I'm like, what did you expect, man? You signed up for this. <laughs> like, there's a reason it's a million dollars at the other end of this. You don't get a million dollars for crying in your tent. You get a million dollars for surviving. So I was watching it and it came to this one character that had gotten pretty, on, pretty far on in the show all of the characters are looking uh, emaciated, really. They're all dropping weight way faster. They're not eating as much as they should. What they do find to eat is disgusting, usually. It's bugs or fish head soup, whatever they can find and make. And there's this guy who I'd grown to appreciate because he was a tough dude. He knew what he was doing. And he even had extra margin to like, make fun things out of wood with his free time. Like, I liked this guy. And it came to this part. They were in this cold place in the north west, probably Alaska or Seattle or somewhere, some island, Kodak Island or somewhere. And it comes to this part where he is, he's been in this storm, in this stormy, rainy Pacific Northwest weather for so long. It's been like weeks. And then the sun comes out. The clouds clear, in the, clear away and the sun comes out and he starts to cry. And in that moment, I said the same thing I always say, like, oh, come on. You're crying, really? Like, you signed up for this. But I realized in that moment that I was wrong. He was not crying at the hard parts. He had signed up for the hard parts. He, he was getting what he signed up for. He was getting weeks in harsh, freezing cold, stranded Pacific Northwest, he wasn't crying at that. He had signed up for that, and he was taking it. What he was crying at was he was getting something that he had not signed up for. He was getting something that he didn't have to get, but when he did, it made him immensely thankful for, and it, made, it brought him to tears. I later found out that he was a Christian, and in that moment, he was thanking God and thankful to God that he didn't have to be given sunshine. But when he was, his heart was moved to tears. I realized I was wrong about this guy and his crying. As we come to this passage, that's what our hearts should be moved toward as well. We shouldn't be upset and crying about what we signed up for, that if we sin, we get justice. Our hearts, especially this morning, especially in light of this teaching and this passage is this, our hearts should wonder at and light up at and be moved by receiving any mercy at all. That you get the sunlight of Jesus Christ's face upon you in, a, in your sin, that you deserve to carry your own cross, but that Jesus carried it for you in your place. Right, that that all of your sin was punished on him 
and he willingly bore it for you when you didn't even know he was doing it for you? Like that, the mercy is what shines in this moment. And so that's where I wanna leave us in this passage as we study it is, this may not solve it for you and I hope it brings you lots of questions and I hope you ask them to me and I hope you calm down before you ask me. (laughs) But let your heart focus on this, the mercy of God towards you. And with that, let's pray, praise the Lord and sing. Pray with me. Lord, you have shown us your glory in your word. And I pray that we would respond like Moses responded and fall down on our face in worship. Lord, you are Yahweh. You are merciful and gracious. You are so slow to anger. And you are abounding and overflowing in steadfast love and faithfulness. Thank you, Lord God. Help us to trust you with you doing what you want to do. Help us to rejoice and wonder that you would show mercy instead of justice. 